but it was regarding um, the data Scott and Eric presented. Was it um, all from gaming or any like actual on-farm events or outbreaks? And then uh, maybe just reiterate um, the pop, the two different populations, mechanical Turk and um, actual pork industry professionals and producers. So we use uh, a number of different audiences. Um, the When we're st first starting out, generally we use a, uh, a public audience in the Vermont area. Frequently that's uh, a lot of students, but also anybody from the general public. Um, we're also using a lot of uh, kind of Eric's expertise, the Amazon Mechanical Turk, um, that group. And that group seems to be uh, a little more diverse. Um, and. Uh, we get some really good data from them, uh, but we also want to leverage uh, those two audiences um, with the actual farmers and the people actually in the industry. So we've taken our our games to both what Eric did with the World Pork Expo. Um, we also do workshops uh, with our experts around the country um, and gather data from them, uh, both in vetting these games and making sure they're realistic as well as trying to figure out their behavior in when they're actually playing the game. Great. Um, but another question um, from Jared, was the cost and time involved of implementing common biosecurity measures considered so players, um, the players could consider this burden on management? So sort of just the interplay of time cost of implementation and the different risks. We saw, saw the example of the shower. How did that play in the different games and scenarios? And were there other risks? Yeah, so opportunity costs are one of the big costs, indirect costs that, that we do have to deal with in this industry. Um, and, and so there, there's two possibilities. There, there, there's one that's investment in new biosecurity protocols, like installing a new truck wash or putting in a line of separation where you did not have one before, um, or sterilizing the feed in some way, uh, changing your management of your, your uh, manure management, something along those lines. And those are typically large costs that are up front. Um, there's also training costs associated with that. So there's a lot of costs associated with uh, new, uh, new biosecurity. There's also the other side of biosecurity, uh, at least from our point of view, um, and that is your willingness to obey those rules, those protocols, and those practices, your compliance with those uh, procedures that are actually in place. And typically the opportunity costs and the switching time uh, for starting to do those things well versus not doing those things well is reduced because you're not putting in new infrastructure. Uh, you might have to do things with changing your training and changing your culture um, I guess the, the long answer to that is we tried to incorporate a lot of those ideas, but it was dependent upon the game, um, and we're aware that those opportunities exist uh, when we're actually developing those games. Uh, to try to incorporate some of that realism, we have to put that into the simulation and some of the economics with some time lags, but that isn't what I would say uh, well, uh, I, would, I would say the data on that are, are not really well described um, at this point in time. Uh, we're aware of it, but it hasn't really been well implemented as far as in our simulations. Okay. Uh, if I could expand really quickly. Yeah. Uh, we also, we try to implement some of these into the, uh, the protocol adoption game mechanics. Uh, for instance, you're only allowed to implement uh, to the next level of biosecurity per round, you can't, we didn't really uh, explain this, but you can't jump from no biosecurity, say, to high. There's a monthly lag in between. So you sort of have to uh, uh, plan ahead, especially depending on the virulence of the contagion. Okay. Um, we have another question sort of along those lines. Has there been consideration on how to apply this concept um, to employees versus owners and um, how do decisions differ, you know, with two different populations there? That is a great question. Um, did you want to take it or do you? Well, I was going to say, we can both say it. We, we're using um, 
an interesting uh, approach to, to look at that. And that's why when we talk about compliance, we think about the day-to-day -day, um, tasks that a worker uh, has to, to take care of. And so that's one level at which decisions are made in terms of biosecurity, so it's compliance. And then the next level up, is the, the adoption or investment in biosecurity and that is um, more in the in the shoes of a, of a manager or of, a, of the owner and so again the, that level indicates also sort of a, a culture that is going to produce in the uh, in, in the farm and in the simulation model we we'll try to capture both effects so the, during the simulation, the agents have the ability to, to respond to um, the presence of disease by adopting, so investing into biosecurity, that's more the decisions coming from the owner of, uh, of the farm. But then we have these effects of psychological distancing that I was describing as if something doesn't happen for a while and everything is calm and clean, we tend to to relax and that's more related to the compliance so we're really trying to um, to include both both level of decision making and then overall when we look at the at the system and we look at the at the effects of this local let's say like on farm um, decision making we can see how overall in the system this um, this decision affects the, the spread of disease and that's more the last level and that's the decision making on um, for the whole system for a for a region, and it's more a strategic level of decision making on biosecurity. So we recognize that the farms are not remote; they're not isolated, and so that top level of decision making uh, that we can be from policymakers is going to affect the, the whole system, and that's how we take we look at it. No, that was great. Um, so it was really interesting. We were, I believe, in August, the three of us were out in Minnesota interacting with one of these large farm systems. And one of the big uh, statements that really came home for me, we're, we're, we're dealing with the managers when we were actually in this meeting. And one of these individuals said to me, um, I'd be really happy if I could get all my guys to use soak. So uh, we're talking about the shower-in, shower-out facilities. And... Uh, they're very aware that there's these issues of biosecurity that they're really struggling with and that those are not the same issues at each level. The issues that the workers and the, owner, the managers are really trying to get the workers to do are different than the issues that the, the owners are trying to get the managers to deal with. So there's, there's, there's these different levels. Um, mm -hmm. really so in all the iterations of the model and the, the number of times you've run it, um, is there any sort of threshold you've recognized or sort of sort of a most bang for your buck sort of threshold? And that demonstration you showed medium biosecurity? Um, in that case, yes. It, uh, it, went, uh, it went well. There is something that is, um, so the, these models are very stochastic. And uh, what we're finding is that to, uh, there is a, um, uh, one factor that is very important is responsiveness and having high responsiveness meaning that having um, agents responding quickly to emergency to the number of um, of infections in their system makes a big difference so that is one of the factors uh, really affecting the ability to control disease and having really good responses like fast responses in both compliance and then possibly adoption, but once the disease is in the system, it's mostly about compliance because maybe adopting new new measures takes longer and investment. But yeah, that promptness is really key. So one of the reasons we actually started looking at that is we had this idea that if we could increase the communication within the system um, and allow for that responsiveness, what would actually happen? So we're, we're thinking about all these ways that we could actually improve that responsiveness in the system and improve communication and what that actually might look like 
as far as changing biosecurity and then the emergent uh, changes to the disease in the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, we've just passed the hour mark. Um, I want to thank uh, our guests from University of Vermont and the SEGS lab and um, all the, the folks that have contributed to this um, research project that we just even heard a little bit of a sliver of today. It's all pretty fascinating. 